Okay, our next speaker, uh, and I think this has been mentioned several times today because everybody has mentioned Ellen so far today, uh, Ellen Mosley Thompson, who is a distinguished university professor, and she's in our OSU Department of Geography and also our Polar and Climate Research Center, and we just got a tour of the Climate Research Center. Um, if you go to our uh, schedule, uh, below the schedule, there is a profile of our speakers and you can link to a video and also a sample open access article uh, that you can see some research uh, from Ellen. Uh, her talk today is going to be past and contemporary climate change, evidence from Earth's cryosphere. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ellen to begin. All right, thanks, Danny. Well, welcome everyone. And I hope you, that you enjoyed the tour that uh, Stacy and Jason provided. And at the end, if there's time, I'm happy to answer any questions that maybe still linger from the tour, as well as any that will come up here in my presentation. Now just go ahead and get started. Just the, the first slide here shows you three different places that our team has drilled ice cores. The Bruce Plateau, uh, which is on the left, is in the Antarctic Peninsula. The Sapu Glacier in the middle from the Himalaya. And then on the right, the Crawford Point uh, drilling site in, in Greenland. So just to highlight the fact that the research that I'm presenting represents the collective efforts of our research staff. I'll use my, my mouse as a pointer our postdoctoral scholars, you see Stacy right here, and uh, our new student, Austin Weber. And I do want to point out that our funding comes from the National Science Foundation, from NASA, from NOAA, and we've had past uh, support from the Gary Comer Foundation. So just let me get this going. All right. So Everybody here knows that our earth is warming. You only need to, um, to open your eyes and look around, uh, go out and walk around to know that environmental conditions are changing as well. So on the left, we have the global land ocean uh, temperature anomalies from 1880 up to 2020. And then on the right, we have the spatial distribution of the temperature trends for each grid point um, on the Earth. But going back to the left, the dots show the annual mean uh, temperature anomalies relative to the 1951-1980 mean. And um, over here, this is the land ocean temperature. This shows us that over that same time period, the Earth, on a global average, the Earth has warmed a little over one degree centigrade. But if you look carefully, you can see that there's much more warming experienced in the high northern latitudes and in the Antarctic Peninsula than there are many other places in the lower latitudes. So we use the term global warming, and that means the globally average temperature of the planet has increased. It does not mean that the temperature at every location on the planet has warmed. And the two warmest years on record are 2016 and 2020. They were nearly tied. They were statistically indistinguishable. And those are followed by 2019, 2017, 2015, and 2018. So effectively, you can say the six warmest, whoops, the six warmest years on record were the last six years. So the warming uh, is indisputable. Now, the climate of the last 40 years has been remarkable, and I have that shown here in the red box. And here we've had increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather. We've had these ex excessive heat waves. We're, the uh, U.S. is now experiencing its fourth heat wave just this year. But the West in West Cent and Central Europe in 2003, 70,000 deaths were attributed to that heat wave and roughly 55,000 deaths to the heat wave in Eastern Europe and Russia. We're now experiencing these prolonged droughts. We know that the West and, and uh, the Southwest and the Western part of the US 
is in the grip of about a 20 year drought. And along with drought come fires. We're now experiencing those in the West and then also flooding. And examples are these large floods that we've had in Australia, Pakistan, and even just recently, the flood in Germany and in Belgium with nearly 200 people killed. Now, the IPC, or what is the, called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the models that they run on a, on a virtually continuous basis uh, show that these type of system responses, the heat waves, increased frequency of the extreme weather, the droughts, et cetera, are anticipated to become more frequent as time progresses. So where is all the additional heat going? About 93% of it is going into the ocean, 2% into the atmosphere, 2% into the land surface, and about 1% into the glaciers and ice caps, and some of that even melting the Arctic sea ice. And the panel at the top shows, us, shows the change in Earth's total heat content from 1960 to 2010. In blue, we see the ocean heating, and in pink, we see the land and the ocean heating. So just showing you clearly that the ocean is warming and the bulk of the heat is going there, which is why it's warming. The bottom panel <coughs> shows you with the three colors, the heating within the, uh, the different depths of the ocean. So the lighter blue shows the heating in the surface down to 700 meters. This middle panel shows the heating between 700 and 2000 meters. And then the dark blue, the dark blue shows the heating uh, 2000 meters to the bottom of the ocean. And half of the increase in the warming of the ocean has occurred in the last, uh, well, has occurred since 1997. So in roughly the last uh, 24 years. Now, we know that global sea level is rising. This is being measured now by a number of satellites. And let's first just look at today's key drivers of sea level rise. Uh, about half of the sea level rise is occurring due to the thermal expansion of the ocean. All that heat going into the ocean heats the water, the water expands, the ocean basin is not getting larger. So that means that the sea level has to rise. The other 50% is coming from land-based ice. And that would be about a quarter of that from mountain glaciers, 10% from Antarctica, and 15% from Greenland, giving you the full 100%. Now, if you look at the graph that I'm showing here, and I kind of outlining with the mouse as best I can, the general shape of that curve reflects the thermal expansion of the ocean. So it just continuously is expanding as ice continues, ice on land continues to melt. But notice that the graph is also divided into three sections. This section between 1870 and 1924, not only is there thermal expansion of the ocean, but some of the mountain glaciers are starting to melt and contribute to sea level rise. And then from 1925 to 1992, you notice that the slope of the change, in other words, the slope of the change is increasing. So sea level rise is increasing at a greater rate. And that is because primarily of the ice that is melting on the mountain glaciers and going into the ocean. And then from 1993 onward, and these are our best data because they come from the satellite observations, we see that now sea level is rising at a rate of three millimeters a year. And that is due to the additional water that's being added from the ice in Greenland and in Antarctica that are melting and running into the ocean. So today sea level is rising at about three and a half millimeters a year. Now, just to show you surface melting on the Greenland ice sheet, uh, the, this panel shows in blue the, the the colors, this is the legend here, the, the more red you have, the more surface melting, the white, very little surface melting, and in blue, mediocre amount of surface melting in 
uh, for last year from January the 1st through October 31st. Now this doesn't mean that all the ice there is melting. What it means is that the surface is experiencing what it's warm enough to experience melt. Now the warmest year recorded in Greenland was 2012. And this panel shows you that virtually every grid point on the Greenland ice sheet was experiencing some degree of melt that year between January and December. And this is what surface melt on the ice sheet looks like. I took this photograph when I was flying from Sonderstrom, which is located here in Greenland, and we were flying up to the Greenland summit. And you see all these melt ponds. And the melt ponds are connected by these streams. And then periodically, the stream actually bores a hole, the hot water or the warm water bores a hole in the ice sheet surface, creating these moulons. And when the uh, moulon reaches the bottom of the ice sheet, that water from the surface reaches that contact between the ice and the bedrock below, and that accelerates the flow of the ice. So in other words, the melting helps accelerate the discharge of land-based ice from the Greenland ice sheet into the oceans. Now, we're also experiencing large and fast changes in the Arctic, and particularly with the loss of Arctic sea ice in the summer. The Arctic sea ice grows back every winter because we're in the dark season. But in the summer or the daylight season, you can see here how since 1979, the minimum sea ice has gotten lower and lower. Now, there's a lot of variability from year to year. This is 2012, which I explained was the warmest year on record in that region. And this is September 15th, 2020, just last year. And it almost rivaled the loss of ice in 2012. Now, we talk about climate change, but it's important for us to recognize that Earth's climate has changed over Earth's history. It's been much warmer than it is today, and it's been much colder. And there are natural mechanisms that influence the Earth's climate, that drive it. And the most important of these is the output of solar radiation, the radiation that comes from our sun. And that is variable over time. Also, the volcanic aerosols <clears throat> that are ejected into the atmosphere, such as shown here from the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991, that also tends to cool the planet because the volcanic aerosols are highly reflective. And in fact, the glo globally average temperature of our planet dropped almost two degrees centigrade in 1991 and 92, because of the aerosols that were emitted from Mount Pinatubo and that re were retained in the atmosphere for 18 months up to two years. And then Earth's climate system has these systems of natural variability. Some of this we don't understand fully. The two major systems are the El Nino Southern Oscillation or the ENSO systems shown here. This is the massive Pacific warm pool that uh, in the ocean that we have during El Nino. And then the cooler water that moves back across and displaces that warm pool during the cool phase of El Nino or of ENSO called La Nina. And then also we have the large monsoon systems that bring the essential rain to areas such as Southeastern Asia. But we also know today that human mechanisms are influencing the climate system. And, or these, we can think of them as anthropogenic mechanisms. One of the most important is the increase in the concentration of atmospheric greenhouses that we see here in the panel on the left. Today, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is about 415 parts per million, shown by the red dot. In yellow here, we have the 
actual observed concentrations measured at Mauna Loa in Hawaii since 1958. And then in blue from 1860 up to 1958, we have the, the carbon dioxide concentrations measured in ice cores, in those bubbles that I'm sure Stacy showed you during the tour. And then also we have changes in aerosols and particles in the Earth's atmosphere, such as the sulfate that is emitted from the burning of coal, particularly from coal-fired power plants that, no long, that don't have any uh, of the technology to remove sulfur. Those gases, that sulfur gas, converts into sulfate aerosols and tends to cool the planet. Whereas the, we burn biomass, we get black carbon, which tends to warm the planet. And this shows the smoke from fires in Guatemala and Mexico. And these particles can be deposited over the ice sheets, and then they darken the highly reflective surface, and therefore the ice surface absorbs more incoming solar radiation. Also, deforestation, such as what is shown here in the Amazon basin, uh, changes the reflectivity or the albedo of Earth's surface. And also, when we lose the vegetation, Earth's hydrologic cycle becomes disturbed. Now, a major challenge in climate science is what is called attribution. That means identifying the mechanisms that are responsible for the climate that we observe. So in this, this graph shows that the temperature anomalies in degrees centigrade, <clears throat> excuse me, from 1860 to 2010. And the dark line that you see here represents the observed data. It's very similar to that first graph that I showed you. And then the red and the, and the dark blue show you the projected temperatures uh, based upon two, mo two modeling exercises. CMIP stands for a, a, a model in comparison. And CMIP, which is computer model in intercomparison, version three and then version five, the results are very similar. And these are the results from over 30 climate models that are driven by natural forcings the carbon dioxide, the natural abundance of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, the solar radiation, the output from volcanoes, all of which we know. And notice that the models predict this while the observations tell us that Earth's temperature looked like this. And, they models, and the models do fairly well up until about 1950 when the projections diverge. Now, in the bottom panel, we have the same information, except now the models are being forced not just by natural forcing, but by also human forcing, and particularly by the <clears throat> concentrations of carbon dioxide, methane, and the various aerosols that are put into the atmosphere by human activity. You notice now, post-1950, that the models are able to predict very well the observations. And so that gives us a lot of confidence if when we say that uh, that a portion of this warming in the second half of the 20th century and now in the 21st century is driven by human activity. And then if we look at the spatial distribution of the, of the temperature trends, this is the temperature trend that the models get when we have only natural forcing. And this is the observed trend that I showed you very early on and the natural and human forcing trends, which is very similar to what we're observing now. So very clearly Earth's climate system is being driven not just by natural, but by anthropogenic mecha forcing mechanisms. Now probably the most a uh, well-known ice core record uh, it comes from a place in Antarctica called Dome C or Dome Charlie. And the record there extends back over eight of these glacial interglacial cycles, periods when the much of the northern part of the, or the northern hemisphere 
is covered by ice. Those are called glacial stages. And when that ice melts back and we have gla the glacial, the glacier distribution similar to what we have today, that's called an interglacial stage. And if we look at this lower panel in red, and this is time zero, going back 800,000 years or almost a million years, you'll notice that the temperature varies from warm to cold, warm to cold, warm to cold. These are the interglacial periods and the glacial periods. Today, we're in a an interglacial period called the Holocene. You note the temperatures are warmer. Now, the blue panel just above shows the concentration of carbon dioxide in parts per million, and that's measured on the air that's extracted from these bubbles. Uh, I took this photograph with simply with a hand lens of an ice core from the Bruce Plateau in the Antarctic Peninsula. So now you see that when the Earth has experienced interglacial or warm conditions, the CO2 content is higher, roughly around 280 to 300 parts per million. And when the Earth is experiencing a glacier sta glacial stage, much like it did over the last, the prior 100,000 years, prior to the current 10,000 years of the Holocene, you notice that the CO2 concentration is low. And so the pre-anthropogenic level of CO2 in the atmosphere is roughly 100, 280 to 300 parts per million. These are the warm phases. And then the glacial stage average is about 100 parts per mil lower, which is about 180 parts per mil. But if we look at where we are today, at 415 parts per million by volume, we can look back over that 800,000 year record and we can see that the CO2 concentration in the Earth's atmosphere has never been as high as it is today. And if we hadn't plotted the methane concentration, we would have seen that that was exactly the same situation with methane. Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Scenarios for 2100 suggests that under what we call the business as usual model for emissions, the CO2 content of the atmosphere might attain a value of around 1,000 parts per million. And one of the important things that I want to stress is that carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere for decades to millennia. So the CO2, the CO2 or the methane, well, let me back up and say correctly, the carbon dioxide or the CO2 that we emit today will be in the Earth's atmosphere for many decades to many millennia. And this curve shows you the decay of fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions. So on the left is time zero, and the y-axis shows you the remaining fraction of CO2 that's emitted at time zero as we go forward to the right over to 100 years. So 100 years from today, which would be time zero, a third of the CO2 that we're emitting into the atmosphere today will still be in the atmosphere. And if we to, were to extend this curve further off to the right, out a thousand years, 20% of the CO2 that we're emitting today would still be in the atmosphere. And this is what makes the emission of, uh, the emission of carbon dioxide so important to our Earth's climate system and to the nature of the climate that we can expect to have over the coming centuries out to the next thousand years or over the millennia. So want to just wrap that part of the discussion up by looking at the human footprint on Earth. This is a picture of the Earth at night showing the lights. Here's the US and Europe and Japan and, and China and India. And what's important as we look at this, what we're seeing are the lights. And lights come from the use of electricity. So we're essentially seeing global electricity consumption. And yet one and a half billion people on our planet 
do not have access on a regular basis to electricity. We know that we have to provide electricity to these one and a half billion people. We have to do this to help lift them out of poverty, to have light at night so that children can study and get an education. But that's going to take more energy. Today, 85% of the world's energy is produced using fossil fuels and 65% of the energy that is used to power the electric grids of the world is produced by fossil fuels, primarily by coal, natural gas, hydroelectric, nuclear, and the renewables. And today, the renewables account for just roughly 5% of the world's electricity usage. This next picture shows you what the electricity consumption is expected to look like in 2030. So this, this, we're going to have a sustained growth in global electricity consumption, and it's really inevitable. And so we have to look to other ways to provide this electricity. And we'll discuss that briefly in a few moments. All right, I want to get to the talk, the, I want to talk for a minute just about what's happening to the glaciers all around the world. And what we see is this recent and rapid melting of glaciers. This shows the 20th and 21st century changes in ice cover. And the places where you see red, essentially the ice is in retreat. It's either shrinking or down wasting by melting, or in some cases doing both, down wasting and shrinking laterally. And all the black dots show you the places where the ice core team has drilled ice cores. You can see on the Tibetan Plateau, Kilimanjaro, in Antarctica, the Antarctic Peninsula, up and down the axis of the Andes, in Alaska, in Greenland, and in the Russian Arctic. And these are the names of all the places where our team has drilled ice cores. So, and because of that, as Stacy pointed out, our freezers are full. Now, I'm not going to stress this because Stacy has given you the tour, but we have a class 100 clean room in which many of our analyses of things like dust, major ions, black carbon, and microbes are um, well, the microbes aren't measured in the clean room. They're actually measured in a laboratory over in the microbiology department by a postdoc in our group. But notice all of the equipment that we have, including this mass spectrometer that's used to measure trace elements. And then we store our cores in the freezers that you've gotten to see. And we also have a machine shop where we fabricate our drills. So let's take a look at a few places where our team has drilled ice cores. This is the Calcaya ice cap. It's located here in South America. This is the Cordillera Vilcanota, and this is the Calcaya ice cap. Looking at it from the ground, you can see it's a very large ice cap. It's actually the Earth's largest tropical glacier. This shows the margin of the Calcaya ice cap as it appeared in 1977. Lonnie first saw the Kelkaya ice cap in 1974. But notice these layers. These are annual layers. Because the, the climate here is monsoonal, meaning we have a wet season and a dry season, most of the precipitation, of course, comes in the wet season. And then during the dry season, these dust layers form on the surface. This shows the drilling of the Kelkaya ice cap the first time we drilled it in 1983 and the drill, which was powered by solar panels. This was the first ice core to be drilled by solar power. In 1980, 19, sorry, in 2003, our team returned to Kelkaya to re-drill it. And this shows you an example of the, Kel of a, the, ice, ca of the ice core drilled that year, and you can see these 
a darker spots show you the dust layers. But you've already seen plenty of ice cores because Stacy gave you the tour. So we want to look at more ice. Uh, but what I want to do is look at the analyses of those cores. Now, we only are look, looking, going to look at two graphs. This is that oxygen isotopic ratio. It's the ratio of the heavier isotope O18 to the lighter isotope of oxygen O16. And you see the seasonal variability. And over on the right, we have in, in the red or the brown is the seasonal variability of the dust. These are actually those dust layers that you saw in the margin of the Kilkaya ice cap. And we can count these back for hundreds of years. What we have done here is created a, an isotope composite to get a temperature history for the tropics and the lower latitudes. It's based upon four ice cores from the Tibetan plateau and three ice cores from the South American uh, Andes. This is time zero, and this is year 2000. Notice that the, there's a lot of variability in this temperature history. Right in here is what is called the climate, the medieval climate anomaly, when temperatures were relatively warm. This is the little ice age period when temperatures were cooler by about a degree to a degree and a half. And now we have the warm period that we're living in now, the last century to century and a half, the post, the post 1850 period. And you can see how rapidly temperature has increased. But this record is different from the record I showed you at first, because that was measured. And measured, the measured records only go back several hundred years. This record going back two uh, centuries is based upon the oxygen isotopic record from those ice cores. Now, there's a book that you might find interesting called A World Without Ice, written by Henry Pollock, a retired professor from uh, the university from, from the University of Michigan. We love him anyway, he's, even though he's a Michigander. And he wrote in the book, nature's best thermometer, perhaps its most sensitive and unambiguous indicator of climate change is ice. Ice asks no questions, presents no arguments, reads no newspapers, listens to no debates, is not burdened by ideology, and carries no political baggage. As it changes from solid to liquid, it just melts. So what is the ice on the planet doing? Let's look at some examples. These two images are from the Kelkaya ice cap. This is the largest outlet glacier from Kelkaya, the photo taken in 1978, and the photo taken 40 years later in 2018. Notice that the outlet glacier is gone and it's been replaced by this lake, which is roughly 200 meters deep and covers 85 acres. We've already seen the margin of the Kelkaya ice cap as it appeared in 1978. This is how it appeared in 2002. So in just 24 years, the margin of that ice cap has receded. And you can see that the margin no longer looks as crisp with those visible annual layers. This is a photograph of an ice field that our team drilled in 2010. And it's in Papua, Indonesia, which is New Guinea. It's called the East North Wall Fern. Here is the tent in which the drillers are working. This is the tent that is used for core processing. And here is a person standing for scale, looking at this large crevasse. If we look straight on at this glacier, the drill site 
is located right up here on this call. This pic picture was taken July 1st, 2010, in the year that our team drilled multiple ice cores to bedrock. This is February 27th, 2020. You can see that the two glaciers still exist, but in much more diminished form. Much of the ice is gone and it's anticipated that this glacier, that these two glaciers will disappear within the next four to five years. In fact, our team has looked at changes in surface area for four low, low latitude alpine glaciers. This is from Kilimanjaro. Notice the downward trend, Kilimanjaro here, the photograph of Kilimanjaro. This is from Kelkaya and the Cori Kalis Glacier. Notice the downward trend. In the, in the um, Himalaya, this is Nanunami, often uh, also called Gurla Mundata, and notice the downward trend. And the glaciers in, on Puncak Jaya in Papua, Indonesia that we just saw, and the downward trend. And Lao Tzu said one, at one time, if you do not change your direction, you may end up where you're headed. These graphs suggest where we're headed, possibly to a world without ice and a world with much higher sea level. And this is not the place that we, this is not the direction in which we would want to head. This image is complementary of Dan Schrag, our, one of our colleagues at Harvard. And the next image, you're going to see what this, uh, what this, uh, the Gulf states look like if we were to lose 5% of the ice that's currently on land. Important to remember, it is only the ice on land that melts and runs to the ocean that raises sea level. The melting of Arctic sea ice does not raise sea level because that ice is already floating and displacing the same amount of water that will be replaced when that ice melts. But if 5% of the ice that is currently on land melts, this is what Florida and the Gulf Coast will look like. And it's important to remember that over half of the, of the world's population now lives in, these, in large cities, and many of those large cities uh, reside in the coastal area. Also today with our rising temperatures and our worsening droughts, we have more fires. This is the Ranch 2 fire in August last year in California. And this shows the, what San Francisco looked like, what that smoke uh, created over San Francisco in August, 2020, and the smog from the, fo from, the, from the fires. And this is definitely deleterious to human health in addition to uh, our, well, in addition to the damage that it's doing to, uh, the ecosystem, other ecosystems. This graph shows total wildfire acres burned. These are acres burned in millions of acres from zero to 12 million acres from 1983 to 2020. And you'll notice from 1983 to 2000, the average number of acres burned was roughly 3,000 I'm sorry, 3 million acres per year. Since 2000, the average has been 7 million acres burned per year. So we have definitely have a problem with our climate system and um, we have lots of extreme events, droughts, wildfires, heat waves, et cetera. Also, we have increases in the scale intensity of these extreme events, such as flooding. This is extreme flooding that
that occurred in Hawaii on March 9, 2021. Weather related losses are already soaring and between 2017 and 2019, in just those two years, the annual cost of weather related losses has been $210 billion, which is twice as high as was as accumulated in the previous 10 years. And right now, I was looking at the satellite images today, we have flooding in Germany, particularly the western part of Germany, and in Belgium, and with the loss of loss of life of about 200 people, and some people still missing. So that you might, I'd like to wrap up by looking at the question of what can we do? It's important to recognize that we do not have a silver bullet for the problem that we have with our climate system. But we have lots of what we call silver buckshot. And we need this silver buckshot because that is our basket of solutions. We have no single solution. So how can we address global climate change? We have to work to mitigate the emissions of carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxides, the, the primary greenhouse gases. And to do this, we need to innovate. We have to invest in innovation. We have to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. And to do this, we have to, for example, use energy more efficiently. More efficient technology means newer technology, and that means more innovation. And innovation is good. We need that. We probably need to place a price on carbon. I firmly believe that we do need to place a price on carbon because one of the reasons that we are so dependent on carbon is that it has been a very reliable readily available and cheap source of energy. And going forward, energy should remain less, it should remain more uh, cost effective, less, to, less uh, polluting, in other words, with, without such, so much emissions of CO2. But if we price something, it means that we value it. And if we price the carbon, then it will be valued, it will not be squandered. And the way to do this is to invest in carbon taxes and into carbon, uh, into cap and trade policies. It's already been proven, for example, that cap and trade policies work. But Right now, the tendency politically is to look more toward carbon taxation. And taxes, it's kind of a nasty word. It uh, turns people off. And there's a lot of reticence with regard to, cap to, to uh, taxing carbon. But it very likely will be very effective. And there's a much that we can take, many actions, sorry, that we can take personally to reduce energy use. Simple things. And I don't need to tell you to turn off the light when you leave a room or to replace your incandescent bulbs with LEDs. We know all this. We just need to have the will to do it. And we need to most strongly increase our investment in renewables. And this was a cover story from Barron's showing that the cost of renewable energy is falling quickly. If the, you look at the x-axis here, this is 2009, and this is out to 2017. This axis, the y-axis, is the cost per million, mega, sorry, per megawatt hours at $360 per megawatt hour for solar energy just 10 years ago. And look how the price of solar energy has fallen. That's the red line. This is the price per megawatt hour of energy that per, of wind energy 
producing electricity. This is coal and this is nuclear, which is a renewable source of energy. So now you can see that the cost of renewable energy has fallen so quickly relative to both coal and nuclear, and it's become very competitive with natural gas. So this is very good news. And this is a reason that we need to celebrate the future. We have to look to these future technologies. If we're going to be able, if we're going to be able to provide cost effective and reliable energy to the 1.5 billion people who have no electricity. And it's important that when we communicate climate change, we do that in a positive framework because there are many positive aspects to what we're likely, what's likely to happen once we begin to address the issue of global climate change. We'll have many more economic opportunities, more energy independence, reduced risks of fires, floods, etc. We'll have hopefully international leadership financial benefits, societal resilience. We need to have our, a resiliency to our societies. We'll have improved health, more technological innovation, et cetera. Many positives. So I'm gonna wrap up with this figure or this picture, which is from the, uh, the people, particularly young people who have taken to the streets during a global strike. You may remember this last year and they're protesting global climate change. These young people are our future. They're our hope for the future and they're our hope for a sustainable future and a future free from anthropogenic produced climate change. So, want to thank you for your attention and kind of end with this thought that for global climate change, nature is the timekeeper. And the thing is, we are not wise enough to yet see the clock. We know the clock is ticking, but we don't know exactly at what speed and we don't know when we're going to hit the, the, the wall in terms of our climate change. So I'll close with that. I wanna leave just a little time for questions and I'd be happy to answer any of the questions you had for Stacy that she was unable to get, uh, to get to with you. So thank you very much. Okay, we do have a number of questions in chat. So I'll go ahead and read those. Um, somebody asked, what is the source for the chart that was titled that started with uh, change in Earth. Okay, so I'll just go back quickly and you tell me the ch how far back was it? Can that person just speak up? Uh, Edward uh, Cano, if you're still on. I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out what what's the. It was about. Uh, eight it was the first. The first chart. This one, uh, right here. One more, the, uh, no one, the one that showed the atmosphere, the land. This, yes, that one right, that one right there. Um, I don't have this precisely. Let me let me just look down here. Um, this one says it is from Lawrence Livermore National Labs. These are all from the same source as you can tell from the color coding. Okay. So that, that would be, uh, wait a minute, the nature, and this was published in Nature Climate Change. The change in Earth's total heat content? The, the, all of this is from the same source. Okay. All right. And the source, give me the source again, please. Okay. You're going to, you might have to look, this is, a paper that was published in Nature Climate Change. And the 
author's name is very small and it looks like it may be Oreskes. And so that tells me this might have been Naomi Oreskes paper in global climate change. O-R-E-S-K-E-S. -E okay, thank you. Sure. And if you don't find it, you can email me. I'm Thompson.4 at OSU. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Other questions, Danny? Uh, so there were some uh, comments on the, Cal there were just some general comments on uh, the wildfires in California, the uh, clarification on the difference between land ice and Arctic melt. Yes. Uh, okay. Want me to take those two? Uh, they, they were just commenting that, thank oh. you for covering that. Oh, okay. Um, so what policy changes could humans uh, do to reduce con or contain wildfires? Action mold, not just a Smokey the Bear kind of thing, uh, something like uh, controlled burns to establish tire breaks, managing water distribution to dry areas. What does the data tell us to reduce these fires? Well, I'm, I'm not an ecologist, but one of the problems that we have is we do have, we, uh, we ha are, have this extensive drought. This drought has been with us for a very long time, over 20 years. And right now the drought we're having is the largest drought that we've had in the last at least 400 years. And we know that from tree ring records. So what our big problem is that we, uh, is that humans are conducting activities in an area that is naturally dry depending upon water that doesn't occur there. The water that keeps uh, Las Vegas going, that keeps LA going, that keeps Phoenix going, all comes from the Colorado River, which is divided up among seven states and already, already responding to the drought. Part of the problem with the warmth that we have is that now the snow that comes in the winter melts very early in the spring. The ice or the glaciers in those areas are shrinking. The snow packs are not as large as they used to be. And so the Colorado River is not getting replenished. We have too many people living off water that really almost doesn't exist anymore. They're taking water out of the underground reservoirs now. The land is actually collapsing and sinking because in California, they have to take so much water out to grow crops like rice and cotton. Rice and cotton should never be, they should never be grown in a climate like California. So along with all that heat, we have more people moving into the forest areas. We have trees that are dying. That dead growth is fantastic fuel. And because we have more severe weather, we have more lightning. So we've got more lightning, more severe storms. We've got more fuel more people trying to live in close proximity to an area that already is hot and dry. Somebody asked if there are any prospects of geoengineering, specifically they mentioned micro silica beads into the oceans or uh, deep cold water uh, to the surface or massive snow ice making machines? Well, the problem is you can't, it's very, very dangerous to start tinkering, experimenting with Earth's climate. Uh, very few of the, these geoengineering ideas that have been tested and not that many have been but those that have, such as sprinkling iron on the ocean 
to increase fertilization, to fertilize it so that you will have more photosynthesis that will take CO2 out of the atmosphere didn't work. The problem is you have, once you start something like that, you may put something else into play. The, another problem with it is who controls the dials? You have to remember that we share our atmosphere with the entire world. We share the ocean with the entire world. So once we, meaning the global we, humans, start putting things in the ocean, putting things into the atmosphere, we don't know where it's going to go, who it's going to affect, how it's going to affect wildlife, for example, in the ocean. I have not even heard about these putting these beads in the ocean, but let me just say that the National Academy of Sciences several years ago conducted a very detailed study on the geoengineering technologies. And their take home message was very few of them are likely to be successful. Almost none of them are sufficiently mature to implement. And they also take energy. One, one of the geoengineering ideas that it's probably the most popular one, is putting sulfate aerosols high into the stratosphere. Because we know that sulfate aerosols high in the stratosphere will cool the planet. I showed you the, uh, the smoke from Kilimanjaro, from, I'm sorry, the smoke from the 1991 eruption of Mount Pinatubo and and that we know that those sulfur gases that converted into sulfate aerosols and stayed aloft up to two years cooled the planet several degrees. So people have asked, why don't we put lots, lots of sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere? Well, because the sulfate in the atmosphere does more than just cool the planet. The reason we took the sulfate aerosols out of the atmosphere in the first place in the 1970s with the Clean Air Act was because that sulfate comes back to Earth. It, it pollutes our lakes and our, it'll pollute the ocean. It creates acid rain that destroys limestone, it, so it destroys buildings. It acidifies lakes. The, States to the east of Ohio tried to sue us for the sulfate aerosols from our coal-fired power plants that polluted their lakes. So once you start down that path, it becomes very dangerous because you don't know who controls the dial, who decides how much of something is put and where it's put. And we don't even know to great many extents for many of these where it's going. What I'd like to do is after this, I'm going to send, I'll send it to Danny. I will send him the links to those two academy reports because I think everyone should take a look. And well, let me say this, everyone who's doing, who's con seriously considering geoengineering technologies should take a look at that at those two documents. Okay, I probably talked more than I should have. <laughs> no, we are uh, at time. Uh, so I'd like to thank our uh, keynote speaker, Ellen Mosley Thompson. Uh, thank you for joining us today to talk to us about this important topic. Um, I have put your email address in uh, chat so uh, people can reach out to you if we didn't get to something. And we are now at break time. We will resume at 2.15. Thank you, Ellen. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your attention.